Eat a qui qui, kumanchi chen squish, shi shak kum suya. It's a little bit blurry today as where different nations come from due to colonization. The red cedar is known as the, the tree of life. It is good for infected gums as well as throat. There was another dark period right after it and that was the residential school system. Our history, our knowledge, our traditions, our culture was all supposed to be erased. Winter time was a time of gathering. We needed large structures of longhouses. Getting the powder off of it, which prevents Alzheimer's. Dobar dan, dragi moji, i dobrodošli u život u Kanadi. Danas vas vodimo jednu vrlo posebnu avanturu. Nalazimo se u Stanley Parku, to je jedna od najvećih gradskih šuma u Severnoj Americi i ovde su nekada na ovoj teritoriji živeli starosedeoci. Na cijeloj teritoriji Vancouvera, a ona je ogromna, žive tri plemena, to su Maskvim, Skvomiš i Clevotut i neka od njih su živela upravo u Stanley Parku. Svako pleme ima nekoliko manjih plemena, zapravo porodica, zapravo nacija, kako se zovu, i naučit ćete sve o njima. Na ovu turu nas vodi potomak jednog plemena starosedelaca, plemena Šišah. Njegovo ime je Alfonso Salinas i od njega ćemo naučiti sve o tome kako su nekada starosedeoci živeli u šumi u Stanley Parku. Idemo! Eat a qui qui, kumanchi chen squish, shi shak kum suya, a la chat leich, a la Nicaragua, a la skejos, hewos, pardon me, uh, mutiwu kun saila oath, a la tonai hewos tun saila. Emosh emosh to squa omish lewa tooth muskuim suya, emosh to squai squai, emosh to papaya, mutu siya. What I said was, uh, good morning. My Shishoth name is Kumanchi. I uh, come from the Shishoth Nation. Shishoth Nation is my home. I come from the village of Chat Lake. That's where I was born and raised. That's where Seashelf is today. And uh, I come from Nicaragua on my dad's side. So I'm an Afotino as well. I come from the village of Skatos in the Shishoth territory where my grandmother's from, Mukiwut. I come from the village of Zona in the Shisha territory where my grandfather's from. Welcome to one of the homes of the three nations who reside here, and that's Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam. And uh, welcome to the village of Sklai Sklai. Welcome to the village of Hapayak. And uh, welcome to Stanley Park, um, all my relations. So I like to share a song as part of my welcoming. The song I'd like to share is one of my all-time favorites. It is the Chief Dan George song. And the song that he created um, as he was a well-known profile as a Slay with Tooth Nation member, an, a leader, a poet, used his voice to educate people, even when it came to Canada's 100th birthday, teaching the people here how Canada was born off genocide. But not pointing fingers, he did it in a way to bring people together. And this is the purpose of this song as well. It is a, a song of harmony. And uh, the song I sing, the song that I'm going to sing is the song I sing to my daughter when I put her to bed too. Oh, hey. 
Just curious what Haichika is from. The language is called the main one. Yeah. yeah. So a language that is used to communicate through other nations by, I believe, the Squamish and Musqueam using that language to com communicate with other nations that have gone towards Fraser River. It was very common to know multiple different languages to be bilingual. Shishaf language is completely different to our neighboring nations, but we also were able to communicate in other languages. Using Squamish for an example, we have about 20-30% similarity in our language. Our language though, um, certain words sounded the same, but could completely mean something different. Hewos means man standing towards the sun, facing the sun. But Hewos in our language means leader boss, uh, chief. I want to express the, the hands out, the gesture of putting the hands out as Coast Salish peoples. It means honor, it means welcome, and it means thank you. To have an understanding of Coast Salish. So um, I remember I was younger and I, someone said I was Coast Salish. And I was like, no, I'm Shisha. Well, Shisha is a Coast Salish um, nation, one of the many different Coast Salish nations as Coast Salish is a wide range of different groups. So there's about, I don't even know, 50, 60 different nations where Coast Salish. If you look at the map, it's a very small little portion of, you know, what is Canada, United States, uh, North America, I guess you could say. Very small portion. So um, with that, that's a lot of different nations just in the area. Um, we believe that our people's different nations through relationships, bonds, Ties so that we can uh, grow together, passing on different teachings, building that relationship, building protection for one another, as we did have work for the Northern Nations as well. Um, also, doing um, trades, in the meantime. passing knowledge as well is very important. And that was due to, um, through the potlatch. So the potlatch is a, a very important ceremony that we would do during the winter. So um, I just wanted to share before we go how I got my drum. My, my grandfather gave me my drum in a time of healing. Um, big responsibility that I had to take. It made me very nervous, but I learned that I did have a voice. I became confident in my singing. Um, the reason why I got the drum was to be a singer, um, a song carrier for my family as my grandparents went to residential school. The impacts of that, um, they suffered through their whole lives and um, they were stuck in addiction and they wanted to take a different path in life. And my grandfather decided to join the longhouse ceremony as spirit dancers. And, um, he wanted me to become a drummer and drum for the family. And that's how I got my drum about 16 years ago. This area was a place where Squamish people utilized this area for thousands of years. Um, this was an area of gathering. This was a winter village area. And there were multiple different villages in this area because it was easy to get to. And when it came to the potlatch of the gatherings of different nations, they can all come to this spot where everyone can come to as they use the water for transportation. Um, Stanley Park was once an island before, and uh, which means there are different different sides you can come to the island of Stanley Park. Boat. Canoeing was the biggest way of traveling long distance and um, I believe Stanley Park was the heart of the nation to come together. So the village of Sky Squai was the main village and uh, Papaya. So I mentioned those villages in the intro. And, um, I honor them because they have a lot of history here. A lot of history and how People were gathering and also ancestors. Ancestors still here in the park. If they wanted to excavate and dig up for um, remains, I believe they would find some here. 
The village of Squai Squai means the village of the mask. Very sacred ceremony that we still practice today of cleansing when it comes to a lost loved one or just in healing. Um, we have a, a group of mask dancers who come in and uh, share their medicine. And the first mask was discovered by the First Nations here in a hollowed out tree. And uh, the tree was struck by lightning. And um, inside they discovered the first Squai Squai mask. About 1860, Vancouver and Stanley Park were starting to get logged. Um, logging was the biggest industry of development at the time, and um, they logged this area from 1860 and all the way up to about 1888. And they wanted to officially declare this 1,000 acres of Stanley Park and turn it into a park. So they uh, stopped the logging and started letting the forest grow. This is actually a very young forest, um, but you can see we do have evidence of the logging times. These stumps have been sitting here for at least 132 years. But you see their purpose isn't over as they're still very much full of life. They pro provide nutrients for smaller trees, seedlings. This is a Douglas fir. This is a Western red cedar, and they both have Western hemlocks growing out of them. The red cedar is known as this, the tree of life as it was used in so many different ways and uh, I want to share one way right now while we're here and how it was used as spiritual protection still is today so this here this powder here you can mix it with oils and uh, this is known as tummeth for our people whenever there's a floor speaker or drummers that are working on the floor sharing the medicine we have them covered with tummeth and they will have it will have the the medicine person put it on them and put it on their eyes just along the side their mouth their ears their wrists and sometimes even on their heels or the back of their shins and it's so that you could see positive things hear positive things have a positive touch It has got a good flavor to it. Mm -hmm. If you like um, kind of a stronger piney taste, mm -hmm. it could be good for a tea. Yes. Teas. Mm -hmm. And um, also for when it's medicine, you can use it for, um, because there's antibacterials in it, mm -hmm. it is good for infected gums as well as throat. And to collect it, um, we had ways where you see how it's running up from most of the top there. Yeah. When it comes to the bark, you'd have a kind of a funnel carved into the bark, which would also make it the fat run even more. And then put a hole or a bowl at the bottom so that it all collects in there and then come back a day or two later. And of course, having a designated um, container. It's also used as a cleaning agent when it came to cleaning up like, um, well, you know, there's times where you're, you're butchering up a, a deer or cutting up salmon and having raw meat like that can get quite smelly. So you can put this with hot water, warm water, and use that as a cleaning agent. With the history and confusion of where peoples came from going back thousands of years, um, over time, things are going to change where family roots start to go a different path and fork off from one another and new villages are going to arise. So it's a little bit blurry today as where different nations come from due to colonization. Um, in the last 200 years, we've had epidemics of smallpox where it took out about 90 to 95% of the First Nations who were living here. Um, after that, there was another dark period right after it, and that was the residential school system that Canada developed for First Nations to assimilate them, and that had a 50% mortality rate. Um, it also was put in place so that things would be forgotten. Our history, our knowledge, our traditions, our culture was all supposed to be erased due to the residential school. That was the purpose of it for First Nations people. So having the history of our people and our origins is a little bit blurry as you can find stories 
from one place being a little bit different than another place. These things were always shared in the ceremony of the potlatch. Um, that's why it was very important to do the potlatch. And it was a way of sharing these stories, sharing that history. The stories are very sacred to one nation. And if they are building a relationship with another nation, they will share these stories and the purpose of them. Potlatches were held in the winter times. Sometimes you'll be hosting them, sometimes you'll be going to another village. Um, but the main thing for the winter time is having to stay warm. So that's what I like to get into is talk about the energy tree. And the energy tree is what I want to uh, introduce you to. The great grandfather of our tour, this Douglas fir right here. This will be the biggest tree that we'll see in our walk today. You can identify it by its very thick bark and very deep crevices in its bark. It is a very dominant tree in this area. And uh, you can see it also has a lot of its babies, its seedlings all around. It is a very abundant when it comes to firewood. So it is the energy tree because it is used mainly for firewood. So um, the bark is also good for when it comes to um, elderly who have a hard time breathing in smoke. So the bark does not smoke as much as the wood would. And um, the bark would be gathered for the elders when it came to their own form. Another thing we were talking about how, how many villages are in a nation? Mm -hmm. So using my nation for an example, the Shishaf nation, there was never a Shishaf nation until colonization. So I come from the village of Tsonai, that's a traditional village. The village of Skechos, that's a traditional village. Shishaf is a word that was used and created for our nation because as the first settlers came there, we had elderly women who were medicine women helping the settlers with um, illnesses and pregnancies, different medicines. And they were communicating with them and asked, where was the water? Where's the ocean? And the ladies would say, Shishaf which means through the forest, over and under the logs to the other side, Shisha. So they named that area Seashelf. They changed the wording to Seashelf. But also our territory is 155,000 hectares. It's massive compared to the little town of Seashelf. Um, about 28 different villages in that area. About 24,000 people in population at one time before disease and colonization. Squamish, very similar in a way as they had villages from Whistler coming all the way down towards New Westminster here. About 16 different villages, about 30,000 people in population. So that's where things start to change, uh, population starts to grow, family roots start to expand and become their own names. I believe as Squamish peoples, not all the village, all the villages in that territory would say they're just a Squamish person. They would say, I am from this place. This is where my family is from. That's how we traditionally introduce ourselves. Winter time was a time of gathering. We needed large structures of longhouses. Cedar was the wood as it is more of a easier wood to work with. It's lighter when it dries. It splits easier. So these trees can provide a lot of breathing when it comes to planks for your longhouse walls and roofs. Another thing is transportation, using it as a dugout canoe. So again, a large tree, you can make a large canoe out of it. Um, falling a tree can take a lot of work. You need to have it do it at a certain time of year, as well as having it close to the water is very important. So um, a lot of trees were nurtured and taken care of when it came to knowing what tree you wanted to use for a double canoe. You can start chopping and start taking planks out of it. And that way it could start helping form the tree over time as it does change once it scars and tries to heal itself, it'll start to form. You can take a plank and it won't harm the tree. Digging a hole into the stump and putting a fire inside, putting clay at the top, and then having it burn sideways. Oh, cool. After you fall your tree, you form your tree on the outside and dig out the inside. Um, we do have different ways of technology, and that's utilizing what? 
the Creator has given us, whether it's from the mountains or down in the forest or from the ocean. But the mountains provide different stones. One of the stones is the great, the grandfather uh, stone, which is um, a volcano rock. You heat these rocks up and uh, they stay hot for uh, a long term of um, time. So they're used in different ways. But when it came to the dugout canoe, you would have your canoe covered with branches. Add water in the inside and put the hot stones in the inside and it would steam. And that steam would expand the wood of the canoe. And it was the same technique when it came to bent wood boxes. You make a crease, you use that steam and the wood would bend. You keep doing that. And these boxes would be used for different things like storage of food, storage of belongings, clothing and regalia, even loved ones. So there was loved ones that were put in mortuary poles and uh, were honored to be a very well-respected leader that they wanted to keep there to watch over them. Going towards the welcoming figures. So I think we call them welcoming figures as Coast Salish peoples, as the Northern nations call them totem poles, or it was a colonized word, I guess, totem pole. But we have different styles. So we were more of making the masks out of cedar as well as making welcoming figures, distinct figures, carvings, um, scalpings, that represented our lineage, our traditions, our family and peoples. And that could be like, you know, like the mountain goat. Um, that's something that our people, my peoples would, you know, be very well known for. And we also had different kind of resources to make smoke. And that is the Western hemlock branch or even cedar branches or so Douglas fir. The evergreen branches make a lot of smoke. We would use that as a warning signal on top of that cliff point for the next village that's around the bay. The next point, they'll light it up, warning the next village. Because we did have um, northern nations come and raid our villages. Yeah. There was war. There was warfare. Yes. Mm -hmm. The Haida Gwaii are the well known war like nation. They even had the first gun on their canoe when they were fighting the Spanish. They were master canoe makers. They were the ones who traveled far to go and raid villages to bring things back. You would need a, a very large canoe to bring a lot of resources that maybe was running out back home where we were very rich with resources here. They would just take it as well as if they were low in population, they would take people for that purpose to make their population grow. We were semi-nomadic. We used the seasons to go gather resources. And we had main winter villages like here, the big villages where we can gather and share those resources. There's, you know, the prairie natives, you know, the ones who were very nomadic, who followed their resources, whether it was buffalo or whether it was different plants, they had to follow them to survive. With that, I think the population would be a little bit harder to grow. Here, you could settle down, have a baby, and live in the winter village all year round while well, you know you have family out gathering things that you need for the hard times you know that would be how winter time would be spent now i like to go into spring spring is definitely a different time spring would be a time of cleansing as you're going through the winter eating a lot of dried foods um, dried salmon smoked salmon um, different meats shellfish so the new shoots from the, the new um, the forest, one of the very first shoots that come out is the salmon berry bush. And that's all around us right now. Of course, it's seasoned as we're in the end of summer. They're kind of small. And the way to identify them, as you can see, there's the three leaves. You could put the one leaf back and it looks like a butterfly. In the early spring, when they're about a foot high, their stem will most likely be red and you can just break it off at the bottom, peel off the skin and prickles and you can eat the stem. It's very highly nutritious for you. Good for cleansing. You can put it in salads and things like that. Western hemlock. Western hemlock. And you don't need to swallow it. Sometimes it gets stuck in the throat and they make you cough. But I want you to chew on it and taste it. Woo! Ooh. <laughs> taste that? Wow. wow. Amazing. What do you taste? Smell. 
It tastes like a berry. It tastes, there's a, like a eucalyptus aspect. Yes. It's, uh... it's high in vitamin C. It is uh, very healthy for you. It has a citrusy, lemony, citrusy. minty flavor to it. <laughs> so you could put this on your food like salmon. If you were gonna cook salmon. Also, you could put it on game meats, like elk, mountain goats, um, deer. Over the thousands of years of our people developing new um, ways, techniques, and traditions, here at Chowal Alge, which is where the herring spawn in the harbor in Stanley Park here, there could have been a tree that fell into the spawning grounds of where the herring spawn, Western Hemlock. So one day someone could have seen that it was in there. Okay, whatever. Come back a few days later, the branch is just covered with herring eggs. So with that, putting it together, okay, the herring are very attracted to the branch, which they are attracted to the evergreen branches. By using the Western hemlock branch, you can eat these soft needles raw with the herring eggs. And then it was used as a way of stewardship, um, aquaculture. Mm -hmm. So having all that herring grow there gave more opportunity, um, more food for the other fish, larger fish like salmon or crabs. So the technique in the spawning grounds of where the herring would spawn, put out as many branches as you can, more opportunity to lay eggs, taking the branches that you need, leaving the rest so that the, the growth of the population of that resource can flourish. So for next season, there'll be more for the, the next season, more for the next season. This is horsetail and it is a historical plant among us today. It is probably the oldest plant that is still with us today. Awesome. Going back 345 million years. So it's really good okay. for your keratin, which is your fingernails and your hair. So if you were to eat the pockets in the early spring, late spring and summer, it can make you ill. So um, it's very important to take it at a certain time. Early spring is good. Okay. And it has pockets of juice that are very sweet. If you were to make a tea, so gathering the needles like that and drying it out and uh, getting the powder off of it, which prevents Alzheimer's. Another one is the swordburn. Today, people are selling them in the restaurants and markets. A lot of the vegetation is good. Um, the skunk cabbage, not a very good food for the tummy. It can make you very <laughs> sick. Just... But it was also used as a tool. So oh. the wrap, the giant leaf, you can wrap your game meats and um, we practice pit cooking, slow cooking in a hole using again those volcano rocks. Many, many different species of berries will come out after that. Like the huckleberry, you can see there's one or two little tiny red berries on this little bush here. Oh yeah, I love those. There's um, thimble berries, there's elderberries. Traditional dishes in the pit cooking, having your game meats like elk, mountain goat, deers, even bear, seal, seafoods was a big one. Salmon, um, rockfish, octopus, squid, and uh, prawns, crabs, shellfish. Shellfish was a huge one, cockles and oysters, things like that, as they are all year round resource. There are purposes of lakes and swamps as they're known to purify. They also use lakes like this ponds to purify, so uh, purifying your spirit. You can see the bulrush here too, the long grass, mm -hmm. and uh, those are also used as we live in big structured longhouses with big openings. You, you had uh, women weaving the long grass to make dividers so that there was different rooms, different sections inside the longhouse. You can also use the root, the bulb of the bulrush which would carry enough carbohydrates and energy as much as a potato would when you're in the end of winter time and running out of resources. You can gather that and gather your energy. But yeah, that's my tour for today. That's um, awesome. Yeah. It was a pleasure to have all three of you ladies with me today. Uh, thank you for that. And thank you for having open heart and um, open ears sharing your knowledge with me as well.
I to bi bilo to. Nadam se da vam je ova avantura bila uzbodljiva koliko i meni. Jako smo mnogo toga naučili i ovo je samo uvod u nekoliko priča o starosedeocima koje ćemo imati. Ako vam se ova priča dopala, lajkujte je, podelite je sa prijateljima, napišite mi u komentaru šta vam se najviše dopalo. I nemojte da zaboravite da od nedavno imamo profil i na Patreonu. Ako želite da podržite moj rad na ovom kanalu, možete preko Patreona, a naći ćete link za Patreon u opisu ovog videa malom mesečnom pretplatom da podržite moj rad, a u znak zahvalnosti dobijete razne pogodnosti poput toga da sve ove dugačke videe možete da gledate dan ranije pre premijere na YouTube-u bez reklama. A ima i nekih drugih pogodnosti. Hvala svima vama koji ste me već podržali na Patreonu, a hvala i onima koji će to tek učiniti. I pre svega, hvala vam na pažnji. Ostanite mi dobro i vidimo se uskoro.